Bismillah. I want to start off by uh, greeting our hosts, the Inter-African Committee, Gandhi House, and all their partners in Norway here. Of course, I salute the host country through their king, the king of Norway. And, uh, I'm a big fan of uh, monarchies. So I'm very happy to be in Norway. Beautiful, clean, and, and green city, uh, city also. I love it. It's quite an interesting theme that we are discussing here. Dismantling the patriarchy is actually very scary if you ask me. Because I am Muslim. And if you look at the etymology of the word patriarch and the history of the use of the theme patriarch, you cannot miss the forefather of our religion, Islam, Ibrahim, alayhi salam, we call it Abraham. And uh, in our Quran, we are told. So we ask to follow the patriarch. So if you are asking me to talk on dismantling the patriarchy, you are asking for trouble. And if I say Abraham, the father of uh, both the Christians and the Muslims. So it's quite an interesting topic and I decided to start off by interrogating the platform itself, the theme used. Do we need to dismantle patriarchy? That is the question. We have religions, religious systems, cultures, cultural systems that may not be perfect, but I believe generally they served us very well over thousands of years. If they have shortcomings, should we dismantle them or should we interrogate them and try to understand them better and mitigate their shortcomings rather than doing the proverbial throwing the baby with the bath water. No system is perfect and every system is subject to abuse. But uh, platforms and conversations like this, I believe, can help us to become better human beings, better societies, powered by justice and compassion. Because if you are a Muslim, you are a Christian, you follow Muhammad who is sent by Allah as what rahmatan lil alami, a mercy and a blessing for all humanity. We talk about Jesus, Isa, Alayhi Salam, who is known as the King of Peace, who can follow these two beacons of light and oppress people and treat people unjustly. No, you cannot justify it under either Islam or Christianity. So this is where I think the interrogation should start. God made men and women different, but does that mean that the woman is any less than the man? No. If there are inclinations in terms of uh, choice, taste, or style is different, does that make them any lesser? No. I think it actually makes the world an even more beautiful place. If you look at Islam, for instance, which sometimes some people use to try to justify their own personal proclivities. You see that uh, that religion, there is no other religion or system that treats women better if we understand it and apply it as it is supposed to be applied, as uh, revealed in the Holy Quran and practiced by the uh, lead head of our religion, the example that Allah asked us to follow, Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in whose book you will find a verse so powerful, so, so, so threatening to those who oppress the female gender. 
If you're really a Muslim and you read these verses, you will think twice before you raise your hand against a woman or a girl child. Allah tells us, وَإِذَا الْمَوْعُودَةُ سُقِلَتْ بِأَيِّ ذَنْبٍ قُتِلَتْ And this verse is coming at a time when people have female children, they would kill them. And Allah is saying on the day of judgment, one of the first questions that would be asked, among the questions, when the girl child is asked, for what reason was she killed? And this is a very profound message that came like more than 1,400 years ago. And still some people want to oppress women in the guise of religion, not in the name of my religion, in which there is a surah, surah Ahzab, with a verse where Allah says, Inna al-Muslimina wal-Muslimat, wal-Muminina wal-Muminat, wal-Qanitina wal-Qanita, wal-Sadiqina wal-Sadiqat, wal-Sabirina wal-Sabirat, wal-Khashi'ina wal-Khashi'at, wal-Mutasaddiqina wal-Mutasaddiqat, wal-Sa'imina wal-Sa'im, up to the end of the ayah, wherever Allah says something, about the male, he would say the same about the female, repeating it. And Allah is not free for us. All right, Mamo, should I put down your mic and just talk to my audience directly? <laughs> or oh, you don't like what I'm saying? <laughs> See, these men, they, these men are still here. They, they don't even want to hear this message. <laughs> so Allah is saying, the Muslim men and the Muslim women, the believing men and the believing women, the obedient men and the obedient women, the truthful men, the truthful women, the patient, wherever he says men, he says women, to show that you work, you get reward as a man from Allah, as a woman, you do righteousness, you get paid righteousness. One of my favorite commentators once said, This is in our Quran. How can you use that book to try to de demonize or diminish women? This is our deed where the desire for a male child, as narrated in Surah Ali Imran, led to the birth of a female child. Lisa that was the complaint. She was expecting a male child that could be dedicated to the service of Allah and got a female. But who is that female? Maryam salam. And she became one of the greatest human beings, one of the greatest human beings ever, who gave birth to one of the greatest human beings ever, Isa alayhi salam. You talk of Western civilization, modern civilization, progress of humanity is based on the Holy Bible. And you cannot talk about the Bible without Jesus. In Islam, we call her Isa ibn Maryam. That's the son of Maria. So we cannot demonize or diminish women because we, those of us who be at the place for it, are nothing without women. I happen to be the last born of my mother and I have three sisters in my family. So I cannot stand demonizing or oppressing women. So the point is to look at our religions and our culture. I had a very good old senior friend of mine, the late Bartarawale, icon of journalism in the Gambia, who once called me into his house and told me, Mudu, sit down here, I'll teach you something, I'll put something into your head. He said, when you talk of our culture, see from, of course, the Mandinka tradition, and if I talk about Mandinka, I mean Manding, because an empire that has wallops, you see, even in the Sarah, even in the Sarah, you can't even say that. You can't even say that. You can't even say that. Where is my ego, Mr. Sulgun? I saw him here. Hello. 
So he told me in, in the Manding culture, our women were actually the chancellors of our exchequer. And he started telling me how, if you look at the land tenure system, how the pharaohs are all bequeathed to the women. They own that have the rights. What happens when your son marries a daughter and she comes in, she gets to get a part of that heritage. And he told me in ancient Monday, wealth was measured in gold and cows. And that gold was all kept by the women. And he said, that's why if you look at uh, our Mandinka women of old, they had these loads and loads of gold on their ears. It was not just for decoration. They were the holders, bearers of the treasury. They were the chancellors of the exchangers of Manding. So if you understand Manding and the history of Manding, you will not look down upon women, and you will not uh, disrespect women, and you will not deprive women of holding position of responsibility in society, because it's unjustified. So Katun <laughs> So Islam it's a globalized world. We can learn from east and west, but we start at home and then you build on that. In my case, like I said, I'm the last one of my mother. I have sisters who took care of me, contributed to who I am today. In my home, I have, uh, well, those living with me, two sons and, uh, and a daughter. Latif does the dishes, he cleans the kitchen. Hadija helps occasionally. I have a uh, nephew, Fulos. Celebrating his own right in the Gambia yesterday was his birthday, happy birthday, full of. Uh, he, he does the dishes when he maybe is not there. Sometimes we have a paid meal. I'll get my clothes to flow to wash them if I feel that we pay, we pay her. But I think sometimes she's overburdened. I give it to flow to wash it and she, she does it gladly. So it takes us back to what Musa was saying that we may need to, you know, start this training at home. We cannot. Uh, uh, shed our responsibilities and give us the teachers, they are overboarding also. And uh, the Honorable mm -hmm. Minister mm -hmm. of Women's mm -hmm. Affairs also mm -hmm. says some of these uh, quote-unquote patriarchal mm -hmm. traditions mm -hmm. can be a body mm -hmm. to men also. But I think we need further dialogue also between the two sexes, 
especially with the wise old ones who saw yesterday and are seeing today, then we can discuss these things. I think women need support. I think women need help, especially those women who are called educated women. And, uh, you know, sometimes I feel as an educated woman, you've got to be lucky to have the right man to progress, whether you are in academics or as a profession. I, I've learned a lot about this. And, and it, I think it takes a lot of dialogue. I'm, I'm lucky to have a very beautiful, smart wife that I call my better brain, you know, and uh, we support each other. I am nothing without her. I'm sure maybe she feel the same way, like I feel, but I'm very troublesome. But we try to support each other. And sometimes, anytime, I, I recently saw a smart Gambian woman from Scandinavia uh, rising in her profession. I said, I'll connect her with my wife to mentor her. Because you, you see the fragility sometimes, you know, because uh, no matter how smart or strong you are as, as a woman or as a man either, and this is true of both sexes, you need the support of your spouse, and you need the support of your family, and you need the support of your society. And men only progressing in education and career does not make us a better society. It's better if both men and women are supported to become better educated, to become better professionals, we have a better society, and our children become better children, and they learn better religious and cultural practices so that we can continue to build a bigger, better, and fairer world between the two sexes. At the Southern Leadership Academy, we have a cultural choir where we have all our lead singers are female singers, and among their songs are songs actually to celebrate women, uh, high achieving women, women and what they can do in our societies, for our societies. So we don't have to just leave it at the level of conferences and speeches, even our traditional songs. Uh, I know Dr. Palasaho in the United States of America who does research on the traditional issues, brought in a group of kindly women, and he was recording and analyzing their songs of how sometimes our women get back to us men for all our excesses. And I thought that was very cool. You know, women, you know, when they want to get back to you, get ready, man, you will hear them. So maybe <laughs> next time bring those group of Kanyalan women here, let them um, walk a finger or something, and cross back in our place. And you guys are good at that. Well, I know something about that. But our sisters, also and mothers, make life easy for yourselves. And I have a sister and then was her gas service, she police service. I used to go to the uh, market for her. I just finished sixth form. One day I was at Albert Market, my auntie saw me. Yeah, move it, not have to do that. She thought that was so shameful. And I did it gladly. And my sister didn't force me. I go to the market for my wife. I do it every time. You know, but sometimes it's the women, hey, but you know, not all doing it, but you might like and they say, ah, maybe I can't say, no, I'm talking to Google, I'm talking to Google, I can't move away. And I do it gladly, and I'm very proud of helping my wife. And I think the burdens, I mean, the, 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 the social system has changed. At first, women were housewives. Now it's almost impossible anywhere to have only one parent working to support a family with this expensive education, insurance, medical or otherwise. So we need to help each other. So we cannot, I mean, like, I, I love our traditional systems. I'm not into dismantling patriarchy. I think we can interrogate patriarchy, understand patriarchy better, both from the religious and cultural angle, and infuse more justice and fairness. Because I'm offended by injustice of all types, all forms, or all shapes. I mean, the golden rule is do unto others what you would like them to do. To you. If you don't want your spouse to treat you badly, don't treat your spouse badly. If not for any other thing, in a marital home, man and woman, you have children's children to raise. What you do or do not do to or for your wives affects your children. And if you want your children to be happy, <laughs> make sure that woman is happy because their falsehood comes from their breasts. You know, so, so I think there can be win-win situations in terms of gender relations, learning better our culture, ignoring those who abuse both religion and culture, and presenting our culture and our religion as it's supposed to be. I think both are just. I think both, both are fair. I think both are compassionate. So let us learn. Let us learn to love. Let us learn to be fair. Let us learn to uplift each other. In a very cruel world, we all need to be bright rays of light and sweet breezes 
of law, tender loving care and fairness. I want to thank you all again for uh, having us here with the colleagues and uh, congratulations to the Inter-African Committee, Gambia House. Congratulations to the government of Norway and thank you to the government of Gambia for being represented here ably by distinguished professionals like the uh, Honorable Minister of Human Affairs and my brother, Mr. Kamara, the Director of the Diaspora Department. Thank you.